Hello. Recording. Cool. Welcome to the uh, the Math 101 Exam One Review. Uh, Nadia will be uh, leading a uh, exam review game. Uh, we encourage you to participate. Um, but yeah, this is just for practice. So get out a pencil and paper, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you would like to join mid-game, I know that you can enter the game pin and it'll just add you to the game. So uh, that is nice, but in the interest of time, we'll just go ahead and get started. Any questions, feel free to send them to me in the chat. We'll be monitoring. First question, flipping three coins, what is the probability of flipping all heads as a percent? Kind of a two-part question here. Cool. Oh, we have a lot of people in here. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you, Madison. I see that you put the game pin into the chat. Thank you for doing so. It's in the bottom right hand corner too, if, if you're new and coming in. I think we can go ahead and, uh, and move it on. So just press skip. And cool. So we got, we got, uh, so 14 results for 50%. And, uh, and 25 results for 12.5% and a few for 25%. So this is an example where we'd want to kind of go through the problem. Um, cool. Um, okay, yeah, so um, we're gonna go ahead and start with the probability of flipping one head. So when you flip one head, the probability of you getting a head is one half. And because we're flipping three coins, all of these are individually independent events. So we'd have to multiply them together, one half for the first coin, one half for the second coin, and one half for the third coin, which would give us one out of eight. And then to turn that into a percent from fraction to decimal, we got to divide, so long division, go here. Eight can't go into one, so we're gonna put a zero. Oh, eight can go into 10, it can go one time. Eight. So two times, 16, and then 45 times. So it's 0.125, and that as a percent is 12.5%, which would be the yellow, yeah. yeah. So I don't know, do I leave it up there or do you clear it? That, I think uh, give one second for people to write it down, but um, yeah. So if you guys have any questions, uh, like I said, feel free to put them in the chat. We can always go back to something. This is literally just for your guys' practice. So, um, so we're, we're here to answer your questions. That's the important part. So feel free to clear it and we'll move on. Okay. Go to the next one. Oh. Belated oh, Llama. Oh, we, got, we got one question in the chat. So where did the 10 come from? Uh, in the last problem, so yeah, I'm just gonna take over. But um, the ten was just the one eighth, and so when we do long division, the top goes into the inside, so it's a one. But technically, it doesn't can't go into one, so we got to add a decimal point. So technically, one point zero. It's not ten, um, and then eight can go into ten one time, and then eight, then it's two, and then that's how we got the twelve point five. Perfect. Thank you. 
I should have left it up. <laughs> uh, that looks good. Okay. Go to the next one. Good question, Rebecca. Yeah, and please, please ask questions. Um, if you have a question, I am. I have, there's a good probability that there's another person in this room who has uh, has a similar question. So. So now flipping three coins, what is the probability of not flipping all heads? So what's the key word here? Uh, how can we use that? So I'll be quiet. All right, so since we did get some other answers, I'll go ahead and go over it. So what is the probability of not flipping all heads? So when we see the word not, we're gonna automatically think non-occurrence formula. So probability of not flipping all heads um, is going to equal one minus the probability of flipping all heads. Ooh. And the last problem we found um, the probability of flipping the three heads was the one out of eight. So we can plug that in for this part right here, one out of eight. And then we're gonna subtract it from one. We gotta make common denominators since um, we're subtracting. So this one right here would turn into eight out of eight. It's a giant one and then subtract the one out of eight, which would give us the seven eighths. This is a blue one, so yeah. And then if you have any other questions, um yeah feel free to put them in the chat if you want me to go over something again um but yeah okay no questions i'll go ahead and go on to the next one i'll go ahead and clear it okay So the next question is probability of passing chem is 60%, probability of passing bio is 70%, and the probability of passing both is 50%. What is the probability of chem or bio? Think what are the key words here and what do we do with the key words? What, what formula do we use? What's going on here? Thank you. 
And I'm sorry to be a distraction. I'm gonna post uh, an attendance survey to the uh, to the chat. Uh, fill it out whenever you're ready to leave. There's uh, um, just asking for kind of your, your student email so we can uh, keep track of attendance for data purposes. We all love data here. Um, and then um, and then also just a, a little question of like how the, the workshop went. So feel free to fill that out at the end. I just want to make sure you had access because it'd be very helpful to uh, track that data. Thank you. All right, so since it's slowing down, I'm gonna go ahead and skip the question. All right, so we got 80%. Some few of you chose some different answers, so I'm just gonna go over it. Um, okay, so we got Probability of passing chem is 60%, probability of passing bio is 70, probability of passing both is 50. What is the probability of chem or bio? So when we see chem or bio, we know that we're gonna have to use the disjunction formula, which is probability of A or B is going to equal probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A and B. In this case, our event A would be the 60% for chem and the 70% for bio would be our event B. And then we're gonna be subtracting uh, the passing both, which would be 50%. So 60 plus 70 is 130. 130 minus 50 is going to give us the 80%. So the probability of passing chem or bio is going to be 80%. And that's it. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat if you'd like to me to go over it a different way. If not, we'll go ahead and clear it and then go on to the next one. One more second. Okay. I think we're good to go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Five green, two blue, and eight red marbles are in a bag. Drawing two marbles with replacement, what is the probability of drawing two green? And I see the uh, the time limit thing. We we reset the times uh, earlier, and I feel like they it didn't save. So when it well, yeah when when we get the majority of our answers, we'll we'll skip it just for time purposes. I know that we're only about fifteen minutes into it, but I want to make sure we can get through all the questions to answer people's questions at the end. Um, someone from the last question asked if we could um, change it to decimals and I just left it as a percent um, because we have to change it back into a percent at the end. So I just left it as a full percent. Just because I saw a few more people came in, I'm gonna uh, put the attendance uh, survey into the chat again. Oh. Okay, so, so awesome. I see you're answering uh, each other's questions in the chat. That is awesome. I see one person asked, um, is this an add or multiply problem? And uh, thank you to another student who answered multiply because they're separate events. So awesome. Good teamwork. And we are fine with teamwork here. If you guys want to 
ask each other questions in the chat and have the, uh, the majority answer as well, feel free to do that. And I think we can go on and skip this. Well, okay. I mean, move on, yeah, not skip. But... All right, so we got one ninth and a few people chose a one third. Okay, so let's just do this one. Okay, so there's five green, two blue, eight red in a bag. Drawing two marbles with replacement, what is the probability of drawing two green? So like in the chat, you guys are talking about how if it was an adding probability or if it's multiplying. And the reason um, that it is multiplying is because they are independent events. So when they're independent, meaning that um, the probability of getting one event doesn't affect the probability of getting the other, we can multiply them. Um, so in this case, the probability of event A, which would be drawing one green marble, would be five out of the total 15 marbles. And then we'd be multiplying that by getting a, a green the second time, which would be five over 15. And a five over 15 can be reduced to one third if you um, simplify it by five, because five can go into five one time, five can go into 15 three times. So that's one third, and that would be one over nine for the probability of drawing two green. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if you want me to go over it again, let me know. Not, I will go ahead and clear it and then I'll go ahead and go to the next one. All right. Good job, elated llama. Okay, so for this one, it's the same five green, two blue, eight red. Drawing two marbles without replacement, what is the probability of drawing two green? So this one's similar to the last problem, but there is something that is different in this problem. And the answer is reduced. So that's part of it is you want to practice reducing uh, your answer. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and skip and then go. All right, so the majority of you guys did get it right. Um, I'll just, should I, I think I'll just go over it since there was a few slightly different answers. I, I think it's worth it, yeah. Okay, so um, for the last one we did with replacement and this one's gonna be without replacement. So how that changes our um, independent events. So the probability 
of event A, we can multiply it by event B because these are independent, again, like the last one. Um, for the first one, we're drawing two green, so it'd be five out of 15 again. But for the second event, we're not replacing the marble. So that takes off one less green marble, but there's also one less marble total. And we can reduce these. This one can be reduced by five, which is one third. And this one can be reduced by two. Two goes in four two times. Two goes in 14 seven times. And then we can go ahead and multiply straight across two and then 21. So yeah, the reason that it changes is because it's without replacement. So that just takes one less marble off the top the numerator and denominator for the second event. So um, if you have any other questions, put them in the chat. This is an independent event because, or no, yeah, it's a dependent event, sorry. Because um, the second event um, changes based off the first one since because you pulled it out and didn't put it back, um, the probability of the second event changes. So that means it is dependent on the first event because you didn't put the marble back. But in the other case, it was independent when you put the marble back. Yeah, good question. Um, any other questions? So yeah, independent um, means that the probability of getting one event um, isn't affected uh, by the probability of getting the other event. So in this case, probability of getting event B, it was affected by um, this event because there was it was without replacement, so you kept the marble. Whereas in the other one, um, it was independent because each event was unaffected by the other because you were, you were putting the marble back. Yeah, great question. So yeah, I'll go ahead and clear it if there's no more questions and then I'll go ahead and move on. All right, this question says a box is painted one half red, one fourth blue, and one fourth yellow. Throwing two pebbles in, what is the probability that the first lands on blue and the second one lands on red? All right, we're gonna go ahead and look over now. All right, so I'll go over it since a few of you said that you have no idea how to do this one, so we'll just go over it. Um, so we're gonna start with um, this. Uh, this event is gonna be independent, so we're gonna we can use the probability of A times the probability of B, like we've been doing. And event A would be rolling or yeah, throwing a pebble in the blue box and then throwing a pebble in red. So probability of that you get the first pebble on blue, which would be one fourth. And the probability that you'd get the second pebble on red, which would be one half. 
and then we could just multiply straight across, which is one over eight. And the reason that these um, events are independent is because when you throw a pebble, say you throw a pebble in the blue um, part of the box, right? It doesn't have any effect of you throwing the pebble on red. Like the probabilities are still gonna be the same. It's still gonna be one half, one fourth, and one fourth. Um, it doesn't change, so therefore they're independent and we're able to use this formula again. And we can just multiply straight across. But yeah, these events are unaffected on the other. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, because, yeah, exactly. So I'll go ahead and clear it if there's no questions and then I'll go to the next one. Okay. So I want to mention this one is a it, it's a tricky one. The key here is um, is and the other. So a box is painted one half red, uh, one fourth blue, and one fourth yellow. Throwing two pebbles uh, in what is the probability that one lands on blue and the other lands on red? So think about the cases that can occur here. It's it's kind of it's kind of weird, kind of funky, uh, but yeah. Oh. And I'm going to throw the attendance sheet uh, into the chat again. Uh, just fill out the survey uh, whenever you can just so we can track this so we can keep doing fun stuff like this. You're thinking like, Trev, you're having fun here? Yes, I am. <laughs> Do you like watching the triangles dance? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't even notice that until so right now. <laughs> ahead and the slowing down. So we got a few different answers here. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over it. Um, basically, this is gonna be a little bit different than the last one. It's really similar, but um, a little bit different, a little bit trickier. So it says, what is the probability of throwing two pebbles? No, throwing two pebbles and what is the probability one is blue and the other is red? So in this problem, um, it's, a, it's different from the last problem because it asks us, what is the probability that blue is first and then red is second? Um, so in this problem, we're going to have to look at all the combinations that we can get that are blue and red. So we can get blue first and we can get red second, but we can also get red first and blue second. So these are the two combinations that we could get um, that would give us uh, one blue marble or one, yeah, one blue pebble and one red pebble. Um, so what we have to do is to, we have to do the same thing, the probability, we can multiply probability of A times probability of B. So in this one, it would be one fourth 
times one half, but then we're gonna add that to this probability. So getting red first would be one half, and then times getting blue second, which would be one fourth. So in doing this, one fourth times one half, let me move down here, would be one eighth. And this would be the same thing, one half times one fourth is still one eighth, but we're adding these two. And when we're adding, we could leave the denominator the same, which would be eight, and then multiply the numerators, two. Two out of eight, oh, and then we can reduce by two. So then it would give us one fourth. Because, yeah. So yeah, that'd be, that would be this one. Um, if you have any questions about this one, I know it's a little bit trickier. Go ahead and put it in the chat and I can try to explain it differently or if you need me to. Um, but if not, I'll erase it and then go to the next one. Just multiplied across and got 160. Oh, because you, you multiplied across and got 160. Because four times um, two would be eight, so then be one eighth. Maybe you're doing four times four. Or and, and maybe you're thinking uh, multiplying. Uh, so, so this situation, so you have uh, first blue, second red, or first red, second blue. So we're adding those probabilities. So one eighth plus one eighth. When you're adding fractions, you're, you're, you're adding uh, uh, the numerators and you're keeping the denominators the way they are. So, so you keep the denominator of eight, the common denominator on the bottom. So you'd have one plus one over eight, which gives us the two over eight, which reduces down to one fourth. Yeah, that's it. That was, any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and clear and then go to the next one. Yeah, let us know if that didn't make any sense. I can, um, I can explain in the chat. Just uh, send me a private message. That for sure is a tricky one. So a single light bulb has a one in 10 chance of staying on in one month. Given three light bulbs, what is the chance they all stay on? Yeah, this is another tricky one. Um, think about uh, is to break it down to uh, break it down to one case. So, so we're saying okay. So uh, we're given three light bulbs, and we want the chance that they all stay on. So the probability that one stays on is one tenth. So we want the we want one to stay on, and another to stay on, and another to stay on. So maybe that'll that'll help. Uh, frame kind of the idea here, so.
Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and skip it. All right, one of those. Okay, so I'll go ahead and go over this one since I saw some people in chat. We can just go over it just to make sure. Um, so a single light bulb has a one in 10 chance of staying on in one month. Given three light bulbs, what is the chance they all stay on? So this one's gonna be pretty similar to the um, probability of getting all three heads like in the first problem that we did. So basically, since we know that one light bulb has a one in 10 chance of staying on in one month, and we're trying to find the probability of three light bulbs staying on in one month, um, since these are all independent events, we can go ahead and do event one, which would be one tenth. This would be the probability of one light bulb staying on in one month times the probability of another light bulb staying on in one month and the third light bulb staying on in one month. And so then we can go ahead and multiply these all across. One times one times one is just one. And then 10 times 10 times 10. An easy trick to do is just leave it as the one and then add the three zeros. One, two, three. So one in a thousand. So there's a one in a thousand chance that all three light bulbs will stay on. If that makes sense. If you go on to go and put questions in the chat or want me to re-explain. I don't know if that helped. Hopefully that helped. Yeah, and they're independent event, events, so we treat them like the and probability. So it's the probability that the first light bulb stays on and the second one stays on and the third stays on. They're all independent, so we multiply those cases and each light bulb has a one in 10 chance. So yeah. feel free to cruise on. All right, we'll go ahead and clear it. Go on to the next one. All right, so a single light bulb has a one in 10 chance of staying on in one month. Given three light bulbs, what is the chance they all go out? So kind of thinking about this as like a different, so the other uh, question was asking us, given three light bulbs, what is the chance they all stay on? And this one is asking us, what is the chance that they all go out? Like 70 people here. That's so exciting. I didn't realize that's actually unmuted. But <laughs> but anyways, uh, sorry, just posting that uh, attendance survey in the chat again. Um, yeah, so fill that out before you leave um, if you can. That'd be great. And I will be quiet. And if you didn't see it, uh, the game pin is in the bottom right hand corner, 37894, if you, uh, you want to enter that, um, want to get in here, but feel free to just use this as an opportunity to practice the that are on the screen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and skip it. So majority of you guys did here, right? But I will 
Does anyone want me to go over it, maybe? I'll ask Christy. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll go, I'll go over it. Okay, so a single light bulb has a one in 10 chance of staying on in one month. Given three light bulbs, what is the chance they all go out? So this one is asking us, what is the chance they all go out? So that is going to be the opposite of them staying on in one month, right? So it gives us one tenth of it staying on. And it's asking us, okay, now what's the opposite? So what is the chance that they all go out? So when we think of opposite, we're going to think of non-occurrence. So probability of them going out is going to equal one minus the probability of them staying on. And this is for one light bulb. So we can go ahead and put the one tenth here. This is the probability of one light bulb staying on in one month. We're doing going to be doing one minus one tenth. Um, when we're subtracting, we've got to have common denominators. So this is going to turn into a 10 over a 10 minus one over 10, which is going to give us nine over 10. So this is the probability of one light bulb going out. So if we're trying to find the probability of three light bulbs going out and these events are independent, we can go ahead and multiply this out. Nine tenths for one light bulb, nine tenths for the second light bulb, and nine tenths for the third light bulb. And that would go ahead and give us the 729 over a thousand. So yeah, if you need me to go over it again or any other questions before I clear it. But yeah, for multiplication, we just have to go ahead and multiply straight across. So nine times nine times nine and then the 10 times 10 times 10. So yeah, if there's not gonna be any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and clear it and then go on to the next one. All right. Drawing from a deck of cards, what is the probability of getting a pair of queens without replacement? So this one's asking, or this one's telling us that we're not replacing the card. So what is the probability of getting a pair of queens if we're not replacing it? Just letting you all know, I'm stepping out for a sec. Uh, I'm going to be right back, but just uh, just so you know, uh, uh, to private message Nadia if you have any like specific questions. Yes, there's 52 cards in the deck. Can you guys help each other out?
All right, so I'm gonna just go ahead and skip it. All right, majority of you guys got it right, but there wasn't as many answers this time. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, go over it. Um, so let's start drawing from a deck of cards. What is the probability of getting a pair of queens without replacement? So first we're gonna look at, okay, so what's the probability that we can get a queen on the first right? We know that there are four queens in a deck and there are a total of 52 cards. But we're gonna be multiplying this by the second event. And if we're not um, if we're not replacing the cards, this changes because now we have only three queens because we, we took a queen out already and there's only gonna be 51 cards left. So without replacement means we're taking one from the numerator and one from the denominator. And we can multiply these events because they are independent. And so we can reduce four out of 52 by four. So we can reduce it by four four here, which would give us one out of 13. And doing this just kind of makes your uh, multiplication across at the end easier. So 1 13th times three over 51, which is gonna give us three and then 13 times 51, we'll do it over here. Three, one times one is one, zero, three times five is 15. Hold on, <laughs> I got this mixed up for a second. 653. Okay. And that would give us 663. Sorry, got a little messy. So three over 663. And then we can also reduce that down again by three. And three goes into three one time. And then three goes into 663, 221 times. And then for that, you can just do the long division. Um, I don't know if you guys want me to show you, but yeah, that's pretty much for this problem. It changes because of this one, right? This event is dependent on this part because we're taking a card out and we're assuming that it's a queen. So we're gonna have three queens left that we can draw from for the second event. And there's only gonna be 51 total cards because we're not replacing it. So yeah, that would give us one out of 221. Is there any questions about that? I know I kinda moved that a little bit faster. If there's any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If not, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. All right. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this and then go to the next one. Right, so let's go to the next. Okay, so now you're gonna find the sensitivity. Is there any way you can zoom in on that picture a tiny bit? Yeah. I don't know if that'll show the answer. I want to still show the answer. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. And for anyone who has to leave, this meeting is going to be recorded. Um, you just got to go ahead and email Trevor. He sent you the email invitation for this um, Kahoot, and then he'll go ahead and send you the recording. Yes, I'll show the question. Yeah, what's this question asking? Find the sensitivity. Sorry, I had to zoom in for the, the graph.
Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and skip this one. And then I'll just go ahead and go over it real quick. Um, so it said to find the sensitivity. It doesn't show it again, but um, so basically sensitivity, when you're looking at the um, box, it's gonna be the number of true positives over the total number of um, people that have the disease. So that would have been the 9,000 over the 15,000. I know it doesn't show it, but yeah, that would, that's what it would have been. So yeah, is there any questions about like any of this? Anybody want me to go over it more in detail? I know it doesn't show the graph. I'm sorry about not showing the question. I don't know, because I, I zoomed in. All right, if there's no questions, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next one. So this one's asking you to find the specificity. So I go ahead and wrote the, I wrote the little letters to kind of help you guys. I don't know if that helps you visualize a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, once you guys answer, I'll go ahead and move it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go over this one, but I'm not gonna press the skip because it's not gonna show me the table. So for specificity, specificity, it's going to be your true negatives over your total people that don't have the disease. So that's gonna be your the letter little letter D over H, which would give us twenty nine thousand seven hundred fifty over the total people that don't have the disease, which is thirty five thousand. And so same thing for um, sensitivity, the problem that we did before, that would be A over G. So sensitivity equals A over G, which is 9,000 over the 15,000. I'm just going over both because we have the table in front of us. Um, and for sensitivity and specificity, you're looking at the true positives and true negatives, which I labeled on the table and they each have a little letter that corresponds with what you're looking for. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and put them in the chat. If not, I'll go ahead and skip it and then go to the next question. Okay, so 29,750 over 35,000. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and clear it if no one has any questions and I'll go ahead and go to the next one. All right, find the PPV.
And if anyone wants me to label the table again, just let me know and I can put the little letters if that helps you. Yeah, I'll write down the letters. There you go. Now, whenever you're doing these columns, it is helpful to um, write out the letters and kind of just know where each of them are at, like the true positives and true negatives, because it's really helpful in finding um, sensitivity, specificity, PVV, and MPV. So yeah, recommend doing that. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go over it because the answers are slowing down. So for PPV, it's going to be little letter A over E. And what PPV is measuring is the person in, in the population who tests positive that actually has the disease. So that's gonna be your true positive, which is 9,000 over your E, which is the 14,250, which would be this one. So yeah, PPB is person in population who tests positive um, and actually has the disease. So that's where this is where it is, to positive and actually has the disease. Yeah, I'll go ahead and go ahead and press skip. Most of you guys got it right. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, yeah, so prevalence is going to be, oh man, I wish that was looking up. Still had the, um, table, but prevalence is going to be in the position S, and that's just the total population of disease. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what, yeah. Prevalence is the amount of people um, that have the disease out of the total population. I think that's what you're talking about. Um, but we'll go ahead and go to the next one, and then I'll show you, um, looking at the table, what prevalence is for the person who asked in the chat. But I'll go ahead and let you guys do the next one. Yeah, when I go over NPV, I'll also go over prevalence. And then I'll go ahead and write the little letters again for you guys. All 
All right, since it's slowing down, I'm gonna go ahead and go over it and I'm not gonna press skip because it's not gonna show me the table. So for NPV, that's basically giving us um, a person who tests negative and does not have the disease. So that's gonna be D over F. Yeah, so it's gonna be D over F and plugging that in, in spot D we have 29,750. And then in spot F, that's 35,750. So again, this is a person who tests negative. So they're testing negative because it's over here, but they do not have the disease. Um, so that would be NPV, true negative over the total negatives. Um, that's another way of looking at it. And then someone asked about prevalence. So prevalence is going to be G over big S, which is gonna be this one and this one. And what prevalence tells us is um, the percentage of the population that has the disease. So that would be little g over S. Cause this is right here. This number right here represents the population and this number represents people that have the disease. Um, is there any other questions about this or anything someone wants me to go over? If not, I can go ahead and move on to the next one. Just go ahead and put them in the chat if you have any questions. All right, looks like we don't have questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear this. And I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. So yeah, it's 29,750 over 35,750. And most of you guys got that right, so that's good. All right. Suppose 100 out of 1,000 people have a disease. Suppose the test has a sensitivity of 95%. How many people, or how many true positives are there? So go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and draw the um, table so it's a little bit easier to visualize for anyone that wants me to draw. I'll go ahead and draw it right now.
All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip it. All right, I guess I didn't have to do it in yellow. Okay, so suppose um, 100 people out of 1,000 people have a disease. Suppose the test has a sensitivity of 95%, how many true positives are there? So we're gonna go ahead and be looking for this letter right here, true positives. And we know 100 people out of 1,000 total people have a disease. So there's 1,000 people total. So that's going to go right here. Um, this is going to represent the 1,000 people that we have um, total. This is going to be the population. And 100 out of them have a disease. So this is, has a disease column. So we're going to go ahead and put the 100 right here. And if you remember from the other problem, sensitivity is equal to A over G. In this case, we don't know A, so we can leave that, but we do know that the sensitivity is 95%. So we can go ahead and plug that in here as a decimal. So 0 0.95 is going to be equal to A over, and we do know G, it's gonna be the 100 people that have the disease. And so when we're trying to get A by itself, first, what we gotta do is get this 100 out of the denominator. So to do that, we can multiply by 100. That gets rid of that. Multiply this by 100. And that's going to give us 95 people for your two positives. So this answer right here. Um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If not, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. Um, but it's really helpful to make the kind of make the table and kind of plug in what you know and what you don't know, and then kind of go from there. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. If not, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. All right. All right, so suppose 100 out of 1,000 people have a disease. Suppose a test has a specificity of 95%. How many true negatives are there? So I'll go ahead and, if you guys want me to draw the table, I can draw the table again. I'm pretty sure um, someone asked if you're allowed to draw the table on the test. I'm pretty sure if it's paper test that you can just go ahead and draw the table as like your notes. Um, yeah, I think if you have it memorized, just go ahead and like write it out. I think that should be okay. That'd be my guess. And if someone wants me to draw the table again, let me know and I can draw it.
Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip it. All right, so we did get some mixed answers, so I'm gonna go ahead and go over this one. So suppose 100 out of 1,000 people have a disease. Suppose the test has a specificity of 95%. How many true negatives are there? So specificity, specificity is equal to the number of true negatives over the total number, which is d over h. That's if we're looking at the table with the little letters, it'd be d over h. Um, and in this case, if we're just looking at the, the bottom row of the table of the totals, um, there was 100 people that have the disease from the last table that I wrote, and there's 1,000 people total. So in this case, it's saying, suppose that has specificity of 95%, how many true negatives are there? Remember, true negative is gonna be this little box right here. So we're looking for this box right here, and we know that these two, added together, this box and this box is gonna give us the thousand. So this could, we could leave this as 900 because we know that there's not, well, there's no, there's a thousand total people and 900 plus 100 is a thousand. So now we can use the 900 um, to plug into our formula. So we know the specificity is 95%. So we could set that equal to a decimal. We could plug that in for that. We don't know our true negatives, which is in spot D. So we can leave that as a variable, but we do know that there's 900 total people that don't have the disease. And to get D by itself, we can go ahead and multiply by 900 on both sides, get rid of that to isolate D by itself. And when you multiply 900 um, times 0.95, it's gonna give you the 855. I don't know if anyone wants me to multiply it out by hand, but I can if you guys want me to. Um, but yeah, that would give us spot D, so that'd be right here, for two negatives. Um, if anyone has questions or kind of wants me to draw it out, a little bit better. I can go ahead and do that. Um, but go ahead and put in the chat if anyone has any other questions. If not, I'll just go ahead and clear it and then I'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Match the formula with, it, with its name, P of not of A equals one minus P of A. So yeah, um, whoever said non-occurrence formula, it is the non-occurrence formula. There's just a different name um, that you can use for it. Right? That was my fault. That should totally say non-occurrence non formula. You know what? I'm not gonna like, okay. So negation is the same thing as non-occurrence formula. Please don't like, do not commit that to memory. Uh, non-occurrence formula is the proper name. Um, they've changed, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no worries. Uh, Precious is saying that she's never heard that before. That was my mistake. It should be non-occurrence formula. Thank you. You can go ahead and skip it. I, I, I gave it away, but I'm so glad I came in when I did. Sorry about that, guys. So I'll go ahead and, yeah, so it was a non-occurrence formula. Um, anytime you see not, just kind of automatically think non-occurrence. That's always a good way to think about it. All right, mm -hmm. so we're going to go to the next one. So match the formula with its name. Probability of A and B is equal to probability of A and B divided by probability of B. And if you didn't get a chance, I'm going to put the, the uh, attendance survey in the chat one more time. If you filled it out, thank you so much. Um, yeah. 
he really wants us to fill out that darn thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Makes things easier for me. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip this one so we have a little time for other problems. Conditional probability, yeah, most of you guys got this right. So this is basically the probability that event happens given that another event has happened. And the key word here is given. Um, yeah, this is good. So I'll go ahead and go to the next one. Again, match the formula with its name. Probability of A and B is equal to probability of A times probability of B if A and B are independent. All right, so I'll go ahead and just give this one to you. It's conjunction formula. Um, these are when two or more events are both happening and this, the keyword here is A and B. So these are two events that are both happening at the same time. So, and because they're independent, it would be conjunction formula. So I guess we'll go ahead and go to the next one. Kind of get through these faster since they're shorter ones or quicker ones. So match the formula with its name, A or B. Uh, a. It said it was a multi-select. There is only one right answer here. Um, yeah. I'm realizing I needed to edit some more things on there. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, uh, I thought an hour and 30 minutes would be good, uh, uh, but we will conclude this in about uh, five minutes. Uh, one thing to note is the STEM Success Center is open uh, in person Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, 9 a.m. to, well, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays and 9 to 2 on Friday. So we can help you before your exam there, or we're open online. Uh, if you go to our uh, website, if you go to CSUSM and then STEM Success Center, uh, you can click uh, join online uh, and we're, we are open Monday through Thursday, nine to four and nine to three on Friday online. So uh, we have some tutoring available uh, for you guys uh, so you can get more help while you guys study and or you guys are working on your study guide. All right, so I'll go ahead and skip this one. And this one is supposed to be just disjunction um, because conjunction would be the keyword would be and and then disjunction of the keyword would be or so we have to kind of differentiate between those two um so yeah was it multi-select just disjunction <laughs> i'll go ahead and go to the next one so we can get some other problems in okay susan bakes 10 chocolate 10 chocolate and 10 peanut butter cookies will bake six chocolate and 12 peanut peanut butter cookies Find probability of chocolate given that Susan baked it.
All right, I'm just gonna go over it since we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna go ahead and skip it. Um, the probability is one half. So there's two kind of two ways to look at this problem. There's like a more logical way, or you can also use um, the formula that's given. So first I'll go ahead and um, just do the logical way. So what is the probability that it is chocolate given that Susan baked it? So anytime you see the word given, um, we're gonna go ahead and just kind of just look at this part. So given that Susan baked it, so we're just looking at um, just Susan's cookies. And the probability that it was chocolate is 10. And the total cookies that Susan baked was 10 plus 10. So that's gonna go ahead and give you 10 out of 20, which reduces down to one half. Um, you can also use the given formula, which is the probability of A given B is gonna be the probability of A and B over B. Okay, so the first one to plug in for probability of A and B. So it's asking you what's the probability that Susan baked it and it was chocolate. So the probability that Susan baked it and it was chocolate is 10. But that's going to be out of the total 38 cookies because there's 10, 10, 6, and 12. 6 and 12 is 18 plus 20. So there's 38 total cookies. So this would be 10 out of 38. And the probability of B was B, the probability that it was that Susan baked the cookies, which is she baked 20 cookies. This is supposed to be 20 cookies out of the total 38 cookies. So since we're dividing a fraction by a fraction, we can go ahead and multiply by the reciprocal. And these would cancel out, giving us again, the 10 out of 20 or the one half. Um, so yeah, you can kind of think about it in two different ways using the formula or just kind of think about it logically. Anytime it says given, it's gonna be like a very specific um, thing that it's asking for. So given Susan baked it, so now you're only looking at Susan's cookies. And now it's saying, okay, out of Susan's cookies, now what's the probability that it's chocolate, which would be the 10 out of the 20. Um, I know these are a little bit more confusing to think about, but if you have questions, um, please go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, I can feel free to go to the next one if you want me to. And if you guys, if majority of you guys wanna stay like to finish, there's I think six more questions, we can go ahead um, and do that. If not, if you guys have to leave it for that is, okay too but um yeah if anyone wants to stay past to finish the six you can go ahead if not you feel free to leave at four um 16 out of 20 16 out of 20 would give you the total um chocolate chip cookies out of the total number of cookies so the reason that it's one half or 10 out of 20 is because it's asking for only susan's cookies so you're only looking at susan's cookies not susan and wills you're only looking at the chocolate chip that susan makes or made so that's why it would be the 10 out of the 20, not the 16, which would be Susan and Will's cookies. I don't know if you want me to explain it differently for that person who asked in the chat, um, but yeah. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, if you are able to stay, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna make you stay, Nadia. Um, I just, just want to, oh, I'm, like, do you have like class or anything after this? That would. No. Okay, well, uh, then I'll leave it up. Would you like to stay or? Uh, yeah, I can stay. That's okay. fine. Make sure you claim it on your time sheet. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to go around to class. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please fill out the survey now. Um, thank you guys uh, for attending. Um, yeah, Nadia, I can fill up, finish up the last six questions with you. Uh, thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you so much, Nadia, for just for running this whole thing. <laughs> thank you, but I'll let you go. Uh, all right. Have a great day, guys. All right. So, so whoever Thank wants you. to, you're welcome. If you guys feel free, if you guys want to stay for the last few questions, if not, just go ahead and go. But whoever wants to stay, I'll go ahead and wait. Come in or two. I'll let everyone leave. All right. So I'll keep going. I'll go ahead and clear this. No one had any questions. I'll go ahead and keep going. All right, next one. Susan baked 10 chocolate and 10 peanut butter cookies. Will bake six and 12 peanut butter cookies. Fine probability of chocolate given Will baked it. So again, it's one of those given problems. And now instead of Susan, it's saying, what's the probability that it's chocolate given Will baked it? So it's a little bit different. I'll let you guys go ahead and think it through and then we'll come together and go over it.
All right, since there's not that many of us left, I'm just gonna go ahead and go over them like a little bit faster. So go ahead and skip it. All right, so most of you guys got it right. So find the probability that it's chocolate given that Will baked it. So we're only looking at Will's now, just like how we said, only looking at Susan's. And the probability that it was chocolate given that Will baked it is the six out of the 18, which can be reduced to one third. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know in the chat. I know these ones can be a little bit confusing, but I can kind of try to explain it in any way you guys need me to. But if not, I'll go ahead and move on to the next one if no one has any questions. This one's pretty similar to the last one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, expected value. Expected value of a game where we flip a coin if it lands heads, you get $1, but if it lands tails, you lose, or you give me a dollar. So you're technically losing that dollar. So go ahead and set that up. So we're using the expected value formula. I'll go ahead and I'll write out the formula for you guys. That makes it easier. All right, so I wrote the formula out. Hopefully that helped a little bit. So this problem is asking um, for the expected value. And I wrote out the formula, kind of um, that's what, you're, like, what you can use for this problem. Um, but basically it's asking, so what's the expected value of this game? So what's the expected profit or gain or profit or loss um, of this game? So if we land a heads, we get $1. But if we land a tails, you give me $1. So we're losing a dollar asking us how much are we expecting to win or lose in this game if we played it. And then we can use this formula to figure that out. But I'll go ahead and go over it too, if that makes sense to help you out. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go over it now. Okay, so most of you guys got it right, but I'll just go ahead and go over it um, just in case. All right, so Expected value of a game where we flip a coin, if it lands heads, you get $1. But if it lands tails, you give me $1. So our profit in this game would be $1. So we can plug that in here. We'd expect to win $1. And the way we win $1 is if we um, land a head. And the probability of us landing a head is one half because there's a 50% chance that we'd um, land a head. And then our probability of losing. So how much money we would lose would be $1 again. So we'd lose $1. And if it lands tails, so the probability of us um, losing, which would be landing tails, is also one half. So we go ahead and simplify this. Um, one times one half, just be one half, or 50 cents. And then uh, minus negative, or minus one half again. So then it'd be like this, which would give us zero. So since the expected value is zero, um, no one is expected to win any money or lose any money. It is considered um, fair. So yeah, if anyone has questions, you want me to kind of explain it differently, just let me know in the chat. Hopefully that helps. If there's no questions, I'll go ahead and move on. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I just canceled out the ones and then it was left me with the twos. So I just 
so I just subtracted two minus two, which gave me zero. Does that also work or no? Um, I think you can. Yeah, I guess that could work. Well, I think just for, for me, like this is technically one half. So this is technically the 0.5 right here, right? Yeah. So you don't like technically you don't really have this one right here because technically this just equals 0.5. So this one isn't really like existent if you think about it like that. So it just kind of is a 0.5 times point or minus 0.5 right here. Um, oh. So I would just I would leave it just in case. So you're not like you don't get messed up for future problems that this is just a 50 percent chance one half. But yeah, I'm not there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, any other questions? No. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Good question though, because it is um, sometimes it gets tricky. So that's good to check, you know, what you're doing to make sure. All right, twenty-four. We flip a coin, and if it lands on heads, you get a dollar. But if it lands on tails, you give me a dollar. Is this game fair? So we just did this problem. It's um, the exact problem that we did from last time. See, so you guys are answering pretty fast. So, so try to think about what we got in the last um, the last question, and would that number represent a fair game? All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip it so we can just get through these ones, last ones. So yes, it's fair. And the reason that it's fair, um, based off the last, you know, the one times one half minus one times one half, this is 0. 0.5 minus 0. 0.5 gives us zero, just like we did in the last problem. Um, anytime that you see expected value is zero, it's always gonna be fair. So know that whenever it's zero, it's fair. Just automatically kind of just, um, recognize that. that question yeah so it's only a game is fair only when the expected value is zero so when ev equals zero it's fair yeah and then when it's not fair um it's going to give you so basically if it's say it's like 30 cents right so that's it's not technically not fair because you're expected to profit 30 cents um or if it's a negative 30 cents um, that's also not fair because you're expected to lose 30 cents. So if it's positive, that's what you expect to profit. Negative, that's what you expect to lose. So yeah, that, this would be not fair, but zero is fair. So any other number besides zero for expected value is not fair because someone's either gaining or losing. All right, it's a good question. Any other questions for expected value? If not, I'll go ahead and move on. Okay, go ahead and go. Go ahead and clear this. And then go to the next one. All right, you play a game where you win 25% of the time and lose 75% of the time. When you when you lot when lost, you lose one dollar. What should you win to be fair? So we're gonna use the same setup. I'll go ahead and write it out for you guys. The same equation. This one is different um, in the last question because it's asking you, what should you win for the game to be fair? So we talked about the game to be fair was zero. So now it's asking you, what did you win for it to be fair? So go ahead and try to figure this one out and then we will go over it.
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this one and then we're gonna go ahead and go over it. Okay, so $3. So we're playing a game where you win 25% of the time and lose 75% of the time. When you lost, you lose $1. What should you win to be fair? So we're looking for, it says, what should you win to be fair? So we don't know this part, right? Cause we're not, we don't know how much we'd have to win at all. It didn't give us that, but it did give us that we want the game to be fair. So we can plug in zero for expected value. We can leave this as profit. The probability of us winning, they gave it to us, is 25%. We can leave that as a decimal. And minus our losses. So how much would we lose? We'd lose $1. So we can go ahead and plug that in. Just leave it as a one. Times our probability of losing. They told us that we lose 75% of the time. So we can multiply that by 0.75. Now we got to get this profit by itself because we're looking for, okay, ultimately we want to know what amount should we win for this game to be fair? So we got to get this by itself. So first we got to distribute this. So one times 0.75 is just going to be negative 0.75. And then we can bring this down, profit times 0.25 or multiply by 0.25 minus 0.75 is equal to zero because the game's fair. So now what we want to do is we want to get rid of this right here because we're going to deal with this last because um, using PEMDAS, we got to do addition or subtraction before we do any multiplication or division. So do this to get it to the other side, we're gonna add 0.75 because that's the opposite of subtracting 0.75. So we're gonna be adding 0.75 to this side. So 0.75 is equal to profit times 0.25. And so now profit times 0.25 is gonna equal 0.75. So now to get profit by itself, we're gonna be dividing by 0.25, divide by 0.25. So profit would equal $3 when you divide this. So basically to make this game fair, we'd have to win $3 25% of the time and lose $1 75% of the time for the expected value to be zero, which means the game is fair. If anyone has questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I can just try to go over it again, but yeah. That would be the way to do that problem. If not, I will go ahead and move on if there's no questions. Anyone got questions? No. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and clear it. And then we'll go ahead and go to the next one. All right, find the expected number of absences given the table below. So we're gonna be using the expected value formula just like the last few problems we've been doing. Um, so yeah, go ahead and using that formula, what would the expected value of these absences be? Can you zoom in, please? And then it's asking for expected value. Let me know when you guys want me to zoom out. Did you get it? Did you want me to zoom out again? Let me know when you're ready to zoom out. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for letting me know.
Okay, I'm gonna just go ahead and skip it and then we can go over it. 2.3, great. So most of you guys got it. Um, Then you guys want me to go over it or do you think you guys got it? Anybody? I can go over it if you guys want me to. If not, I'll just go ahead and go to the next one. All right. Um, I got some in the chat. Okay, yeah, I'll go over it. Okay, perfect. So oh, it doesn't give me the table. Well, that's not good. <laughs> okay, so I think, I don't know. I think it was 0 0.10. Actually, I do have it. 1.15, 2, 0.3, oh, 3.25. And then it was four and point twenty. So this is going to be the number of. Oh, thank you, whoever said that. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. Okay, so yeah, this is the table right here. So for this problem, um, what we do since there's no uh, profit or losses, it's basically asking us what's the expected number of absences given in the table below. So we're going to have to go ahead and do zero, which is the expected number of absences times the probability of us getting zero absences, which is 0.1 or 10%. And then we're gonna add that to the one absence and the probability of getting one absence is 15%. Um, and then we're add that to two absences. So probability of getting two absences is 30%. Probability of getting three absences is 25%. And the probability of getting four absences is 20%. So for this problem, we're doing the number of absences times the probability. So we can go ahead and simplify all these here. So this was just simplified to zero. So simplify to 0.15, um, 0 0.6, 0 0.75, and 0.8. And when you add all these up together, it's gonna give you the 2.3. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you're multiplying the value um, times the probability. So the value would be zero absences times probability, which is 10%. I'll show you guys the table. Um, so one absence, the value of that, or the probability of that was 15%. Two absences, probability of that, 30%. So I don't know if that's a little helpful. Yeah, is there any, any other questions um, for this problem? I know most of you guys got it right, but any other questions before I go to the next one, the last one? If not, I'll just go ahead and clear it and then we'll kind of move on. Okay, let's move on. All right, so last question. Find the number of possible four digit codes and their numbers zero, zero through nine. We'll go ahead and build this one. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip it. So it's going to be 
10,000. And the reason for this, so this problem is asking us to find the number of possible four digit um, codes and the codes can each be numbers zero to nine. Um, so this problem, we're gonna be using the accounting principle and the counting principle formula is N times M. Uh, there's probably been problems like this about like number of sweaters and like different combinations. It's basically just finding how many different combinations can you have total. So for these ones, I like to set it up. If we have a possible four digit codes, there's gonna be possibility of four, four different um, combinations we can have total because there's gonna be four. And each combination can have numbers zero through nine each one of them. So for zero through nine, there's a total of 10 different numbers you can have, including zero. So we can go ahead and put that up here. So we have 10 different combinations for each of the four um, lines for the code. And what we can do, we can just multiply straight across. And then one easy trick is leave the one and then add count many zeros. One, two, three, four. So there's gonna be four zeros, which would be 10,000. So there's 10,000 total possible digit codes if we're using the numbers um, zero through nine, because there's 10 different numbers possible. And so that would give us a total of 10,000 codes. So yeah, if there's any questions, go ahead and put in the chat. Um, if not, that was the last question. So yeah, that's pretty much all we have for today. Um, thank you guys for being here and for joining. Uh, good luck on the exam. And then Feel free to come to STEM, STEM Success Center too if you guys need any extra help. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're and welcome. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Good luck.